Hi, I'm Sin Ho, and today I'll be talking to you about our work on gradient descent algorithms for Beres Wasserstein Berry Centers. This is joint work with my collaborators Tyler Maunu, Philippe Rigolet, and Austin Strom, all at MIT. The starting place for our work is the notion of an average. Now, we all know how to take averages of things such as numbers or vectors, but once it comes to objects with more complicated structure, such as images, then it becomes less clear. For instance, we can take an L2 average of the two images, which means pixel by pixel, we take the average of the intensities of the original images. But as you can see, this may not be the right notion of average for certain applications. For instance, it doesn't seem to respect the shape of the original two images. Another notion of average is the Wasserstein Berry Center, which was first introduced by Agwe and Carlier in 2011. And since then, it's found a number of applications in many areas, such as fairness, economics, neuroscience, and statistics. And this is the notion of average we'll be considering in this video. In this images problem, what we can do is we can encode each image as a probability distribution. And we formulate it as a statistical problem by assuming that the images are sampled from a probability distribution P. Now, because the images themselves are probability distributions, P is a probability distribution over the space of probability distributions. Next, what we do is we equip the space of probability distributions with a new geometry, different from the usual L2 geometry. And this new geometry will give us a new notion of average. In particular, the geometry we're going to use is the geometry of optimal transport. Now, when we think about generalizing the notion of average, we should start with the Euclidean case and try to draw analogies. In the Euclidean case, the population mean of a distribution P can be characterized as the point in RD which minimizes the average squared distance to a point randomly drawn from P. This isn't the way that we're first introduced to the notion of a mean, but it turns out that this definition generalizes more easily to the setting of a metric space. In particular, what we can do is we can take this definition and replace the Euclidean norm with the squared Wasserstein distance. The Wasserstein distance is a distance between probability measures, and I'll talk about it more later in this video. The minimizer of this quantity is known as the population Wasserstein Berry Center, and it's going to be our notion of mean. In the Euclidean setting, we can also talk about a sample mean by replacing the distribution P with an average over samples drawn IID from P. And analogously, in the Wasserstein case, we have an empirical Berry Center. The empirical Berry Center is a natural estimator of the population Wasserstein Berry Center. And so it's natural to ask this statistical question of how well these empirical estimators approximate their population counterparts. In the Euclidean case, we know the answer. The expected squared norm between the empirical mean and the true mean is exactly the variance divided by n. In the Wasserstein setting, recent works have studied the problem of statistical rates for the empirical barycenter. And by now, we have a fairly good understanding of the statistical properties of the empirical barycenter. In particular, we know that in certain nice cases, I won't talk about what nice means, the empirical Berry Center converges at a rate one over n, which matches the Euclidean setting. However, in general, the rate of convergence can indeed suffer from the curse of dimensionality. Although this is nice, one thing is the issue of computation. In the Euclidean case, computing the sample mean is trivial because you can just add together the observations and divide by n. But there's no such characterization of the empirical Berry Center in the Wasserstein setting other than as an optimization over the space of probability measures, which leaves the question of what is a computationally tractable estimator for the population, Wasserstein Berry Center. In this work, we address this question by developing tools to understand gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent estimators on Wasserstein space. In doing so, we're going to have to develop a deeper understanding of the geometry of Wasserstein space. Finally, we give concrete co uh, consequences of our results to a special case when the distribution P is supported on Gaussians. Even in this special case, the problem is non-trivial, and we resolve an open question, which was first posed by Alvarez Esteban et al. in 2016. And now, we're going to next focus on this question. First, we need to introduce what Wasserstein space is, and then we need to understand what it means to do gradient descent over this space. So here's a primer on optimal transport. Suppose I have two probability distributions, mu0 and mu1, and we're going to think of mu1, uh, mu0 as a pile of dirt or sand. 
and mu1 is going to be a ditch. And we want to move the mass in mu0 to the location mu1. And we want to perform this movement as optimally as possible. To explain what I mean, suppose I take a particle x and I move it to the location t of x. Then I'm just going to associate a cost with this movement, which is just going to be the squared Euclidean distance between these two points. Now remember, I want to move the mass from mu0 to mu1, and this will translate into the constraint that the push forward of mu0 through this mapping t is mu1. We call this mapping t a transport mapping. And these two ingredients, the objective function and constraint, give rise to an optimization problem. And this optimization problem is precisely what defines the Wasserstein distance between these two probability distributions. Now that we've explained what Wasserstein space is, we need to understand gradient descent in order to understand how to generalize it to this space. In the Euclidean setting, gradient descent can be summarized as you look at the direction of the negative gradient and you move in this direction. So we need to understand these two parts. For the first part, we need to understand what a gradient is. And a gradient can be understood as a direction of steepest descent. Now to make sense of this, we need two things. First of all, at every point in our space, we need to know what is the space of all allowable directions that we can travel in. This is called the tangent space at the point. And secondly, to understand what it means to do the steepest ascent, we need to equip this tangent space with an inner product. These two ingredients, the tangent space, along with the choice of inner product on each tangent space, define what is known as a Riemannian manifold. And we can use the tools of Riemannian geometry to help us with our problem. The next thing to understand is once we have a gradient, how do we travel in the direction of the negative gradient? In the Euclidean case, what we can do is just travel along the straight line, which has velocity equal to the negative gradient. In the Riemannian setting, we just simply replace the straight line segment with the geodesic, which starts at our current point and travels with the velocity equal to the negative gradient. This is how we perform Riemannian gradient descent. Next, what we'll talk about is the Riemannian structure of Wasserstein space, which allows us to carry these ideas over to Wasserstein space. Going back to the optimal transport problem now, suppose that T is the optimal transport map from mu0 to mu1, and consider the vector field V, which is T minus the identity mapping. V is a vector field, which means it's a mapping from RD to RD, and it represents the displacement of mass along this optimal transport. We're going to think of this vector field V as a tangent vector to Wasserstein space at mu0. And we equip this tangent vector with the L2 of mu0 norm. Thus, I've defined for you a tangent space on Wasserstein space as well as a norm induced by an inner product on, these, on this tangent space. This makes Wasserstein space into a structure which bears resemblance to a Riemannian manifold. And this interpretation goes back to seminal work of Otto. We can also describe geodesics in this space. If T is the optimal transport map between mu0 to mu1, then mu1 is the push forward of mu0 through this transport map. The Wasserstein geodesic is actually defined as mu t for t between 0 and 1 as the push forward of mu0 by this mapping, which is just a linear interpolation between the identity mapping and the optimal transport map. Now that we have a notion of tangent space and geodesics in Wasserstein space, we can now talk about gradient descent on Wasserstein space. So consider this functional f, which is the Berry center functional. Note that the minimizer of this functional is precisely the population Wasserstein Berry center. And using the formalism of the previous two slides, we can write down gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent updates for this functional in Wasserstein space. But we want to do more than just write down the equations for gradient descent. We want to understand its performance. And to do that, we need to go back to the Euclidean setting. In Euclidean optimization, a preponderant assumption is, is the convexity of the objective function, which is written here. It turns out there's a natural generalization of this condition in the Riemannian setting. What we do is we replace this straight line segment between x and y with the Riemannian geodesic that connects x and y. And this gives rise to the notion of geodesic convexity, which plays an analogous role as convexity did in Euclidean optimization. Now, if we have geodesic convexity, it turns out there's a large body of works, recent works, in the exciting field of Riemannian optimization 
that aim to provide a wide toolbox of Riemannian optimization methods inspired by Euclidean optimization algorithms. Unfortunately, we're unable to apply these results to our problem at hand because it turns out that our very center functional is not geodesically convex. This is a numerical example which demonstrates that along a geodesic, the very center functional can even look concave. And in fact, this is not surprising. From previous work, it's actually known that strong convexity of the very center functional is equivalent to the space having negative curvature. But it's also known that Wasserstein space has the opposite property of having positive curvature, much like a sphere. So in light of this, we actually would not expect the very center functional to be convex. So without convexity, again, we have to turn back to the Euclidean setting to see what we can do. In the Euclidean setting, here's a set of three assumptions that can give convergence guarantees for optimization algorithms without convexity. Smoothness, the polyak lojic or PL inequality, and quadratic growth. The first two assumptions are already enough to get convergence in objective value, whereas the third assumption is used to translate results about convergence in objective value to convergence of the iterates to the minimizer. What we do is we prove analogs of these three conditions in Wasserstein space. We prove smoothness and also quadratic growth under some, some natural regularity assumptions. It turns out that the PL inequality is trickier to deal with, and we don't manage to get a full PL inequality. Instead, we get an integrated PL inequality. Now, the question of when the integrated PL inequality implies the full PL inequality turns out to be quite delicate. And therefore, what I'll focus on next is how we can obtain concrete consequences of our results in a special case. The special case is when all of the distributions in the support of P are centered Gaussians. In this case, we can identify a Gaussian with its covariance matrix. And this problem can be phrased as a purely matrix problem. But in fact, the more general perspective of Wasserstein space turns out to be more enlightening and instrumental to our results. In any case, this matrix manifold with this certain Riemannian metric is called the Burez metric after Burez who introduced the in quantum information theory. And therefore, we call this the setting of burez wasserstein Berry centers. In this setting, we can concretely write down what the update equations for gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent look like. Now, the equations are a little bit complicated, but what you should focus on is that they just consist of matrix multiplications, so they're trivial to implement in practice. Here are the equations. I'll let you look at them for just a second more, and now I'll be moving on. These, gra these gradient descent updates were studied in a previous paper of Alvarez Esteban et al. in 2016, and there they noticed empirically that gradient descent seems to converge at a linear rate. Uh, according to this figure taken from their paper. Now in this paper, they take the adoptive perspective of viewing this as a purely matrix problem, and it ends up being pretty complicated in that language. But using the general tools of Wasserstein space that we developed in the paper, we're able to prove this main result in, in the BRS Wasserstein setting. So we have an assumption, which is that the covariance matrices of the Gaussians have eigenvalues which are upper and lower bounded. And with this assumption, we're able to prove that gradient descent does indeed converge linearly, which verifies the observations of Alvarez Esteban et al. Moreover, we're able to show that stochastic gradient descent produces an estimator after n samples, which converges to the true population very center at rate 1 over n, which is the optimal st statistical rate of estimation. These results provide the first uh, non-asymptotic results for first-order methods on Wasserstein space for very centers which go beyond the setting of probability distributions with discrete support. This ends my video, and I hope that you'll check out our full paper.